Thank you. order, please. All right, the College of Complexes consists of the following format. There will first be a brief announcements period. Second, our speaker will then speak for up to an hour. Then there'll be a question and answer period. And then you will be able to rebut our speaker in our third part, which is the rebuttal period. There are two rules in the College of Complexes. One is no personal attacks. And two is one fool at a time. And that's usually the fool in front of the microphone. Meeting 39, I'm sorry, 3539. Ellen Corley returns to the program on the development. She's going to be speaking about free speech tonight. And her introduction is our constitutional laws encourage the freest possible exchange of opinions, ideas, and information, in part that recognizes our worth and dignity as human beings. To, forgive us to, to forbid us to speak minds, I'm sorry, to forbid us to speak our minds, demean us, and uh, makes us more like slaves or robots than citizens of our free country. But as important as freedom of expression is for us individuals, it is perhaps more important for a free society at large. Let's give a rousing round of applause to Ellen Corley. <laughs> your faces uh, so thank you for the introduction um, Ellen Cor I'm Ellen Corley and I always I've been coming here maybe the last three years uh, I love this idea of a free speech forum uh, Doug Finkley and um, Don were the first ones to tell me about this uh, when I came here um, we were over at United for Democracy Now and um, you know, networking, trying to understand how to, uh, you know, how to unite for democracy. And they told me about this. I'm like, this is a great idea. Um, and I, it gets you practice freedom of speech. Uh, I picked this date. I, um, I didn't actually write that. But I, I wanted this date because the 27th, you know, it's been a year-long uh, event at the Newberry Library about um, free speech and race, specifically going back to the race riots of 1919, 100 years ago. Um, they've had all sorts of bicycling around the lake. Uh, I for those who don't know, um, 1919 was a, I think it was called Red Summer, uh, actually have the uh, book uh, that was about that but it's it's a, a interesting idea this guy I've been listening and researching it that uh, it, there was a black boy was his raft actually it was a group of young black boys had gone and they didn't know how to swim they built a raft they got in into the black section of the beach and and held on to the raft and then it, it came across to the to the white section of the beach and the the um, you know things he was basically rocks were thrown and uh, one hit Eugene um, he popped up and they they were he drowned uh, you know when you hear the whole story I mean you hear that he was stoned by white guys and I, I think there was that but when you hear the whole story, it's a little more complicated, but uh, it also it also highlights and forces us to look at something we we really a lot of people think oh that was then that's not now that we don't have uh, ongoing uh, police well and also it's made worse by the police repression the Ku Klux Klan was real then uh, I pretty sure it's real now as well um, it's hard to pin it down but um, I guess the you know what I focus of today I'm not really prepared except for I want to talk about what I've done um, as somebody for the last three uh, five years I I got involved with 
the Chicago Alliance Against Racist Political Repression. Um, it, it's also the group that has pushed for civilian police accountability. It, uh, you know, it's uh, the way I got there, I started with looking, I got involved with Obama's Organizing for Action. We were looking at issues and um, the, the African American women on the team um, were, they all had sons that had been either killed by gun violence, uh, you know, put in jail for having a gun with the stupid laws, uh, he was defending himself. This other one, you know, one son was shot. The police never did anything about it. Um, you know, so as I was looking for coalitions and on the issue, I went to you know, this Justice for All Film Festival um, down at Trinity Church, and that's where I. Uh, this is that's the church that Obama, you know, was part of the Jeremiah Wright one that was so controversial. Um, it, but I saw that, I'm like, this is what community organizing is. I, I really didn't know, you know, activism, community organizing. We, we uh, basically, what we learned through the Obama organizing for action was that, you know, it's uh, have an event and um, get the signatures and, you know, send them off to your congressman. We did it against gun violence, um, handgun violence, trying to push for laws. But basically what I saw was that, you know, this, this is kind of a, by the Northwest Suburbs Organizing for Action. And it was, you know, to me this is not the solution. I did kind of learn, but I went into a gun shop and tried to talk them into not carrying AK-47s and you know, they're, you're doing something, but what the Alliance does, this was started by, by um, Angela Davis, was wrongfully in prison 46 years ago, and um, the group here in Chicago, or I guess it was in Oakland at the time, organized to get her release. And that to me, uh, you know, this, there was Josephine Wyatt, uh, Charlene Mitchell, um, Frank Chapman, who is with us, uh, leading our group now, he was wrongfully imprisoned at that time in St. Louis. Um, um, and now, and then Ted Pearson was a reporter. He's, a lot of these people were with the Communist Party. These are the people that organize every week. We meet on Monday nights, and um, we had three main focus areas. Uh, one was, you know, the justice for Laquan McDonald. Um, to make sure that the first time ever uh, Jason Van Dyke would go to jail. We did get second degree murder. It should have been first degree murder. But you know, that that's the, um, this other one is to win the release of the wrong, the John Burge torture victims, the, the wrongfully convicted, um, you know, I don't know if you know, but in the late 80s, early 90s, um, the John Burge, commander, uh, ran this midnight crew and uh, would pick up people. They had to close a case, especially a police crime. They'd just pick up anybody, an innocent person, bring them in and um, torture them with, you know, they had a black box. They used the same techniques he learned in, in um, the Phoenix program in Vietnam. They were using on uh, the young men, um, you know, that uh, torture them into saying, okay, I did it, I'll say whatever you said. They bang them on the head, they beat them up for days at a time. And um, a lot of people don't want to say they did something they didn't do, but these, you know, people yield eventually with that kind of torture. Um, they, that basically was covered up. That was underneath Richard M. Daly was the assistant prosecutor at the time. Um, the, you know, and Divine was around, um, and so was was Robert Milan, who is now the special prosecutor, who is continuing to try to prosecute these wrongfully convicted young men in order to cover up his own crime, you know, his own police crime. The, and he gets paid to do it by the. Um, 
he's making millions, charging 550 an hour to continue to wrongfully, maliciously prosecute innocent people after they've been in prison for, um, you know, 30, 40 years. Uh, it's, it really is astounding. A lot of people, maybe they heard about it and they think that was then, that's over. But the truth is, the only justice, it was no justice, John Burge, thanks to the work of an investigative journalist, um, John Conroy and People's Law, uh, they um, managed to, you know, um, they they worked with uh, like Anthony Holmes, Daryl Cannon. It's it's all written up in this torture. Uh, it's called the torture machine. It's been written up and John Conroy at the Reader. But they managed to get him for perjury. I mean, you know, lying on the witness stand, um, John uh, Burge. So, uh, you know, he spends three years in prison and still down there, you know, on his boat in Florida. And Richard Milan, who is the special prosecutor here, uh, is visiting him. Um, I've been researching him. There's so much dirt on him. Uh, and so the theme of my talk is free speech. Uh, say what they don't want you to say. That's what what uh, Orwell said. Everything else is PR. It, there is a, a military police secret police surveillance regime in America. It's a government of wolves. Um, it's, you know, came over, it's, you know, it's been in place it, it went through, um, you know, Ku Klux Klan, uh, the outfit, the mafia, all these guys are really, um, work with our, our police, mostly through the, the FOP, the Fraternal Order of Police. Um, they are, they are keeping honest police silent. Um, you know, they they probably shoot them. You know, there's anything to keep this covered up because, you know, um, now I I also have been following the Jesse Smollett case that, um, you know, I'm like I see the pattern of practice. I go down and watch the courts how they rig the trials of Mikhail Ward and Kenny Wilson um, Williams. They needed to close the um, Hadea Pendleton. This was Michelle Obama. She was the young girl who marched at, at Michelle Obama's uh, the inauguration. And they were going, we're going to close this. So we're going to pick up these two guys and we'll pin it on them. Um, I think that's what it looks like they did with Jesse Smollett. Mainly they want to get rid of Kim Fox. So they, they intimidate her. It's a terrorist tactic, um, you know, that it's and there's the media is complicit in it. It's uh, you know you if you listen to the media, you start to hear it that uh, it it's not like anybody's telling Jesse Smollett's side of the story or Mikhail Ward's side of the story. Um, the media has been complicit in this. Uh, going back, you know George Orwell wrote about it. Um, yellow journalism. I, I, you know that's that's the. That's free speech movement. I, I used to be like, what's free speech movement? Technically, it, it's Berkeley, you know, that a lot of people started organizing against the war in the 60s, 64. They, students at Berkeley, like they arrested one guy. They, it, Berkeley said, don't speak. Uh, you know, you're not allowed to politically organize, talk on campus and so they're like yes you can we have to we we have to speak up we have to speak out and um, you know so when they arrest go to arrest this guy I saw that you know 300 people like surrounded the police car that they put him in and stood on top of it and kept it there for 36 hours Can you imagine keeping a cop car you know um, surrounded like that uh, it's it's bold. You have to be kind of bold to um, to stand up to cops, and um, and so like what I've joined Refuse Fascism uh, to try to you know get rid of Trump and Pence, who are you know you know what they are. But uh, they, it's interesting how you know the cops are right there in front of you, 
And I'm like, why don't you say anything? Why, don't, why aren't you guys saying anything with Jason Van Dyke? And they're, they're not allowed to say anything. That code of silence is an actual policy. Um, you know, it's, they're, they're actually having hearings on it now, which is something, I guess, um, this week. But, you know, it's, it's about being at the court, like building that fire, keeping the pressure on, their, on them, saying, you know, Robert Milan, I went up to him uh, after he kept this case going, and um, with Gerald Reed, he, we went through so much to, you know, um, his, get it proved that he was tortured. The torture commission verified it. You know, the, the judge signed off. He goes, yeah, he was tortured. I know those guys. I know the ones that did it to him. There's no doubt. And they go, what do you want to do, prosecutor Robert Milan? You know, and, and they're like, we're going to keep prosecuting. You know, and they just, I went up to him and I said, why would you continue to prosecute an innocent person? He goes, get away from me. You know, and I'm like, well, I, I'm not going to. I've got to keep it up. Go up to the media afterwards. I, I said to all the media, I go, why aren't you telling this other side of the story? Why are, have you read the Chicago Reporter, the where they got you know that this guy you know 500 million or something that's been spent on dirty cops and payouts? You know, don't just say, oh, we were there. He said this. He said that. You know. Tell the whole story. Do the investigative story, and um, and as it turns out, actually, I'm kind of proud of that. That Megan Cropo of the Tribune is writing down the the whole story, really getting into it more. And what's interesting, though, is now the FOP has their their a thing called the Messenger, a little blog of fake news. They it's like Breitbart, right, or Bannon's thing. They go, you know, here are the activist. Uh, activist liberal reporter from the Chicago Tribune, you know, reports this. So that they actually smear the truth teller. That it's they're threatening them. You know, they're when I I ask, can I see the transcript once? And they go, this guy goes, who are you? Oh, I've heard of you. You know, they one thing I found out this week on the news, you know, so you listen for this. I'm a research analyst mainly that the, they came out every time I've gone up to the Chicago Police Board and you've got three minutes you get to say the monthly meeting and it's going to be written down I said uh, you know um, how many of you know that 9-11 was an inside job and you know one woman in the back goes I knew it you know and they're all like the Inquisition there you know That's and, you're wrong. right and, um, and then I'm like how did you know know that um, I, I, I forget John Birch. Uh, yeah. Um, there's a seat here. Yeah. Or, yeah. All right. That sounds good. Yeah, you can sit there. Uh -huh. Yeah. Go ahead and pull those over. Or maybe pull those out of the way. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I think pull my bags out of the way so she can sit there. Uh -huh. Yeah, put them over here. Okay. This your bag, too? Yeah, there you go. Okay. All right, we got to work for the handicapped. Uh, yeah, we got to be accommodating. Um, can you, you go okay with the seat? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you might have to move this out of the way, uh, Heather. You want to move that or something? Okay. Yeah, it's going to have to. Yeah. All okay. right. Uh, yeah, I want to put it back here. Okay. Sorry, I know you got to get. Put it over there, so that won't be in your way. Okay. Um. Hi. Okay. So just to keep going. Um. I. Uh. The Chicago. It turns out that they are. They. Everybody who speaks like me at the police board. Um, is written up. They do. They go back in the office and investigate everything. Try to find something on me so they can smear me. You know, this is this is Nazi Gestapo stuff, basically. And it was brought into America by by um, Reinhard Gillen, Hitler's head of intelligence, uh, was friends with Alan Dulles and the OSS. Um, you know, they brought him, and then they brought. Over 10,000 of the worst Nazi intelligence people into America. This fifth column of Nazi fascist police, 
spread them around the country. They send them, you know, the death squads in Iran, South America, um, Indonesia. This is this is what is going on in all around the world, and that's what they don't want me to say, and that's what I'm trying to say. It's frustrating, but the pattern and practice is there, and you know, in the process of researching this, checking my facts. People say, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. Um, I'm like, well, no, I'm not. You know, the facts are there, and thank God there's a lot of investigative researchers that confirm this, and um, but the question I always have is, why, uh, why hasn't the FBI, the Justice Department, the Court of Justice, the International Court of Justice picked up on this? And, uh, well, because they are them. They were put in by them. Um, they're, they're, you've got CIA as organized crime, uh, you know, all this Republican Party and the um, Nazi Party have been aligned, you know. So now you've got Bannon and Breitbart and Cambridge Analytica and SCL elections who were behind the, um, the Brexit, behind the Trump election. They, they, they even had in the news, you know, uh, it came up, NSA wins contract, or Cambridge Analytica wins a contract with the NSA. They're, you know, they're going, we're going to take all our data and give it to, the, to Cambridge Analytica, who is the little, um, you know, man in the, controlling the machine at, at Facebook and um, Cambridge Analytica, owned by Bannon and um, Steve Bannon of Breitbart News and Citizens United and also uh, Robert Mercer. So, you know, this is a great easy game. They control all the elections on, you know, all over the world, uh, and it's it's easy at one-on-one -on -one marketing. I, this is what I studied uh, as, a, as a market researcher. We always knew that, you know, you can get all the license plates, and then you have everybody's name, and then you can target right to them, you know, psychographically profiling. It, the one thing, you know, all this Mueller came out this week didn't expose is that uh, it's us, you know, um, and it, it was awkward. We're all kind of waiting for some honest, uh, you know, senator or congressperson. They, they won't even touch it in the Senate. Did you hear Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell said, oh, we didn't even watch it. What? You know, I mean, the Mueller reports, right? That What kind of... Well, it's the APAC lobby. It's the American Israeli Police or um, you know Political Action Committee. It's like contract with America in '95. They have to sign exactly what they won't vote for before they vote, and that is kind of a putting your finger on the democratic process. You know, it makes it real easy to you know we we're only going to put right wing guys on the Supreme Court. We're only they only put Federalist Society people on the Supreme Court. The Federalist Society is was started by Robert Bork and Antonin Scalia after Nixon said, fire all those people, just like Trump wanted to do, and, you know, fire them if they're going to try to impeach me. And Bork was the only one who goes, okay, I don't mind. You know, the, all the honorable people go, I'm not going to go fire. You're not allowed to do that, fire the the honest people who are supposed to be investigating the high crimes and dis misdemeanors. Anyhow, the, the bottom line is, uh, you know, free speech. What is a free speech movement? What do we need it for? We need it to say what the military, industrial complex, deep state doesn't want us to say. The, the forever war is, is pushing, uh, repressing people. And that's what they were doing a hundred years ago. They went after the communists who were um, wobblies. We, we had somebody here from the wobblies. I joined you. Um, in the 20s and 30s, they, they had thousands of people in the Communist Party, the Socialist Party, actively on the um, Bughouse Square where we were today. You know, and um, what happened somehow after World War II, uh, they're gone. You know, well, they, you know, they ship. You look back, what happened to the Communist Party? You know, Rosa Luxemburg and all. They, they send them off. You know, um, go back where they came from if they don't like it. I, 
they, people said that to me, you know, it's like, really? Um, you know, uh, it's, I, it turns out, actually, I'm, my parents on both sides came to Jamestown in 1619. They were the first governor of, of Virginia. So we were the Jamestown people. Um, so we really were here before they were, uh, you know. Um, so that, to me, that's kind of like the sword in the stone uh, that God is telling me, Ellen, say something, you know. Um, don't, you know, it's like you've given me a lot of reason to say something. I, some of y'all know that uh, what really radicalized me initially was that my stepfather was, a, he's an Ayn Rand, Milton Friedman, libertarian, um, and I was bought into it. You know, it's hard to <coughs> argue with their logic, you know. Um, but you basically just, you can't argue with them, really. They're, you know, it always kind of makes sense, keep the taxes low and the whatever, you know. Um, but what I came to see when this lieutenant governor, a Trump friend of New York, took my, moved in on my stepfather. My mother had dementia and um, said, we're getting married, you know, and um, basically ran off with, with uh, half of his $20 million estate. She's the trustee of, you know, and it was put through to Manhattan Institute, which was started by William Casey, evil CIA guy that started Iran, you know, did the Iran Contra, has been behind all of this. Um, you know, like, you're like, oh, that's weird, you know, um, but they, they took it all. They took everything my mother had. Um, my sister got the other half. I, I got a little bit. It, I never got any justice. You go down to the police and they say, oh, well, um, you're just a stepdaughter, you know. Oh, you want to come up with $450 an hour to, uh, you know, to get a lawyer? And then the lawyers are too chicken to go after them, you know, or they're already in there with them. And you, you realize that you understand what social justice is by understanding what it's not. It is not, we don't got social justice. I, I didn't even know what it was. And, um, but I know, you know, you know what a human right is when you know that you don't have any, right? There, you, you really don't have them, you know? Uh, you, you know, you're like, police, you know, go get them. And they're like, uh-uh. You know, um, the police are the problem, the corrupt police investigative justice department prosecutors uh and they're in bed with the aldermen and the the congress and um that's why they're not going to impeach you know as we saw with the kavanaugh thing they go you know the fbi doesn't investigate you know didn't you, you everybody knows that i mean how many trillions do we spend on that and they don't even investigate one one sex abuse case so basically what I do is, I'm an investigative journalist, that, you know, working for, for myself, for God, for um, social justice, for, uh, you know, somebody's got to be the investigator, the lawyer, the, you know, advocate, the um, social worker, because they're, you know, the way politics work is, they, you know, if you're the whistleblower type, you don't stay around long. I, I, I've, figured that out actually at People's Energy. I was a market research person and they didn't want me because I talked to the Citizen Utility Board. I'm like, well, I'm just figuring out what people think. Uh, you know, and it's, it comes down to truth. You know, are you looking for truth and are you going to help other people find the truth? I, I have been a teacher as long as I, until they threw me out of that. But it, you know, it's to find the truth, help other people find truth. That's my, my philosophy. Um, Treat people as equal, not above or below. Teach that to the students. Um, help them figure out how to find the truth. And it, um, you realize it's a, it's a great goal, but you're better off doing it um, when you're not trying to do it for the capitalist. You know, they're, um, they really are kind of there to, I look back on it, I work for Monsanto. I mean, they're doing it to put a spin on their, their bad, behavior. That's what PR is. I was like, how would you do that? Well, one, you lie. Two, you make sure the truth gets buried. Um, you know, that's easy enough to do. And and that's that's the pattern in practice. It's not just in the media, but in the courts of law. And so that brings me actually to where really what I plan to, um, my theme for tonight is that uh, tonight I've, you know, got 
a friend here that I've been, you know, what motivates me, I, I've given up on this Civilian Police Accountability Council because they're, they're never going to go for that. They're, um, I hope they would, but we have to be the Civilian Police Accountability Council. We have to do it ourselves. And um, tonight, the, uh, this guy I brought here tonight, a man who was tortured here by John Burge 48 years ago and wrongfully imprisoned all this time, and just got out of prison on July um, 2nd, right, uh, just this month, where we met at the uh, St. Leonard's, where my church is sponsoring that uh, wonderful place for AD reentry program place. Um, but, and I'm going to teach high school there in the fall, adult high school, and also organize out of there. And so, um, but it really is a God thing that. Uh, I've met, uh, we've now met uh, like four or five of the Burge victims have gotten out, usually by trickery, you know, like a technicality or, um, I'm going to tell his story a little bit, uh, the, in his case, um, it really is a great story that we're going to turn into a movie of some kind, uh, that um, he, after 48 years on the parole board, the guy, um, they, there happened to be one cop. He had PSD, PST, PDS, and had been a veteran in the war. PTS, PSD, PSD, post-traumatic stress, right? Um, and had been a veteran, and uh, you know, upstanding guy. And um, but they, you know, somehow um, got in there, you know, got tricked into, you know, to having to sign a confession I assume right and um but and y'all can ask him questions he's going to come talk a little bit but there happened to be and I'm going to say you know one good cop on the parole board that time who said I was a veteran I had PTSD and I you know look he didn't do anything you know um let's let him out it, you'd be surprised how hard it is to get a parole board to to say that I've, I've watched another guy and um, they they just keep them in there because yep. one they'd have to admit that they were corrupt enough to put them in the no. first place I think they often have to sign something and say and I'm not gonna sue you or anything but um so anyhow come on up uh, Eugene yes, um, yes, Eugene Horton here uh, you know, um, 40, 48 years uh, of um, wrongful conviction and uh, we're, he's got a wonderful newsletter. I'm going to be his publicist. Uh, we're um, an, advisor. an advisor, consultant, partner. We're going to have a legal office. We're going to try to get other people out, um, you know, uh, advocate and everything. But he's got this wonderful, great newsletter. And uh, it really is, it's like God's given me my partner. Okay. You kind of need somebody to do this with. So. Uh, He's going to read uh, some of his um, work, and, About two and you can ask questions of us afterwards. We intend to vote for her <laughs> for next mayor of Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> <Wait a minute. laughs> President, my name is Eugene Wood. I'm a chaplain for military vets for the last four years. I've just been released after 48 years imprisonment for a crime I did not commit, and I was released on July the second. 2019, uh, by all 13 members of the parole board, unanimous agreement, let him go today. So they let me go and told me when I get out, a lawyer, get a lawyer, not to sue them, but they can't help me sue. So I'm out looking for a lawyer on that now. Uh, Can you talk into the microphone? We're speaking about wrongful conviction, so I want to explain that to you. I went 48 years with a wrongful conviction, um, and I want to explain what it really is. Understanding wrongful conviction, the case can be made to show the court officials, police, and others responsible for wrongfully convicting people are criminals themselves and should be prosecuted for violating criminal law. The USA is touted as the most modern and powerful nation in the world. Both our state and federal legislators, judges, prosecutors, and police are well educated in the USA. It is very <coughs> unlikely that these smart government officials are ignorant to what the following undisputed facts mean. One, in Illinois, Governor Ryan suspended death penalty services and converted all such sentences after conviction. An extensive investigation that revealed several 
wrongfully convicted defendants. Governor Ryan concluded that further investigations are needed to identify the wrongfully convicted but innocent defendants not sentenced to death. Two, in Illinois, Governor Quinn banned all death penalty executions after his study revealed several wrongfully convicted defendants with death penalty sentences. Three, in Illinois, Chicago Police Commander John Burge was convicted and sentenced for perjury regarding a decade a decades long campaign of torture and coerced confessions of African Americans resulting in wrongful convictions. Four, since 1989, hundreds of defendants have been exonerated of wrongful convictions through post conviction DNA testing alone. Five, there are thousands of well reported criminal convictions based solely on the incredible testimony of eyewitnesses, doubtful identification, coerced confessions, questionable or no exams by specialists in PTSD in cases with some evidence of possible insanity or mental unfitness to plead, be tried, or to assist in defense. The above specified facts make it easy for a person of average intelligence to understand that the U.S. criminal justice system is one of the worst, if not the worst, in the world. Presently, wrongful stops, interrogations, arrests, convictions, and city or state or federal sponsored executions are so frequent in the USA that a scandalous criminal justice system should probably be known as the most deadliest of all catastrophic disasters in the world. This is not an exaggeration. It is clearly obvious to the reasonably intelligent, with or without blind eyes, that the rich and powerful have seized our government in a firm headlock so tight that its unfortunate residents are on the edge of becoming the walking dead without medical insurance, warehoused in ghettos and prisons, supervised by gunmen with immunity to kill, irregardless if the kill is televised and the victim has his or her hands held high. The difference, the difference between the past and present criminal justice system is that big business have realized a greater fortune simply by infiltrating politics to secretly employ sell-out congressmen and women to use their finely honed skills in devising, introducing, and enacting unfair legislation with loopholes that support judges' authority that cause mass railroading of low and middle class residents so quickly with long term sentences for less degree of crimes that prisons can't be built and adequately financed fast enough to avoid warehouses. Class targeting for mass imprisonment of the less financially fortunate and less politically represented in the USA results to the most deadliest of all catastrophic disasters in the world. This result is repeated in numerous countries that use this unfair method. The lack of an effective check and balance system allowed corrupt officials, corrupt government officials, to use this unfair method to imprison despite race, color, sex, age, religion, political affiliation, or health. Wealth and superior class is the only protection against such oppression. To seek in the same association are advocates of the enactment of state and federal laws that would reduce wrongful convictions, such as making it a criminal offense to decide of moat conviction in a case of clearly obvious actual innocence with the mandatory sentence of 10 years at 100%, $100,000 fine, and permanent loss of government job for every judge, prosecutor, and police involved. I'm almost through here. Now, to seek in the same association, which is, which is the association that I created once I was released, uh, it's, going, it's ongoing now, have reason to believe that there are over 370,000 victims of wrongful, wrongful conviction in the USA. And we suspect millions of such victims worldwide. If you also believe that you or someone you know was wrongfully convicted in the USA or anywhere in the world, contact us and provide a self-addressed envelope with sufficient posters for our response. We have found a suspicious reported sequence of events led to questionable convictions of the following people, and we are eager to prove their answers. David Ayala, Illinois, USA. Idi Amin, Uganda, Africa. Rudy Bell, Illinois, USA. Marion Berry, DC, Washington, D.C., USA. H. Rapp Brown, Georgia, USA. Lil Wayne Carter, Louisiana, USA. Angel Class, Illinois, USA. Jeff Ford, Illinois, USA. Joachim Guzman, Mexico. Clifford T.I. Harris, Louisiana, USA. DeBrat Harris, Georgia, USA. Danny Harris, Illinois, USA. Patty Hurst, USA. Larry Hoover, Illinois, USA. Eugene Horton, which is me, Illinois, USA. Alan Moore, Illinois, USA. Michael Johnson, Illinois, USA. Little Kim, 
New York, USA. Remy Monk, New York, USA. Marlon Madison, Illinois, USA. And Goosey Maine, Atlanta, USA. Curry C. Murder, C. Murder Miller, Louisiana, Louisiana, USA. Orville Miller, Illinois, USA. James Walker, Illinois, USA. George Ryan, Illinois, USA. Reverend L. Sharpton, New York, USA. O.J. Simpson, Nevada, USA. Jimmy Soto, Illinois, USA. Daniel Steele, Missouri, USA. Gregory Whitelow, Illinois, USA. Fernando Zayas, Illinois, USA. And James Lewis, Illinois, USA. So my name is Eugene Horton. I'm leaving my phone number with the, uh, the owner of the bar here, with, well, with our manager here. Uh, so anybody that, that call or write, get in touch with me with, with your phone number, I'm at St. Leonard's Place. And um, I'll be there for another six months, uh, one year. But we about to get an office with this lady here. We're going to run this beautiful lady here for the next round because she got the right solution. And uh, yeah. that's it. Yeah, stay up here. Yes, yeah. ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So I'm thinking, yeah, we're also having a fundraiser um, well, by church on August 4th. St. Um, Chrysostom's is having a, uh, inviting all the young men of, um, from St. Leonard's uh, to to their, be their guests for dinner. Uh, I'll tell you more about that next week. That's Sunday, a week from tomorrow at 6 o'clock. Um, we, we volunteer there. Uh, like I said, I'm going to be teaching, but um, there, yeah, well, we're going to, more will be revealed, as I say. We're going to be working, uh, focusing, because that that's what grounds me as a, they say, think global, act local. You know, um, injustice anywhere is just injustice everywhere. You know, um, work on, you know, concretely, when you, uh, like today we were at the speech, and Natalie Moore's talking, and he's like, you know, I'm glad to meet you, and, um, you know, the whole room stood up, and um, they all clapped, uh, Stanley, right, and that's what we have to get the word out, the, the, as a communications analyst, my theory that uh, pretty much holds up is that they, um, there's this cultural norm of not saying anything, and that's dangerous. Um, as Andy says, um, you know, and it's not but the climate change. You know, it, we we're got, we've got to start talking about that. It, it's not easy to be an organizer, an activist. You know, to mobilize a revolution. You know, and um, really wake everybody up. You know, um, sometimes I'd say I wish I wasn't woke. It's so frustrating because you can't get the truth about power and corruption. You know. Um, to power, and uh, but yet I think you know um, it does the empathy that we have of wrongful conviction, and it's undeniable. I think we can get to the Supreme Court. This is my dream: is that the government did not, if there's a First Amendment, have the right to <coughs> oppress people on the basis of their political convictions. If we say, um, you know, we. They have waged war on communism, you know, which never should have been done, you know, and I don't know why we let them do it, you know, um, but you realize it's true. What they did to them, they're doing to us. First, they come for them, they come back and get us, and uh, that's <coughs> exactly <coughs> excuse me, what they done. Now, you, you guys probably wondering, how did I beat the case? So I'm going to tell you, I didn't beat it. The world was seeing evidence of my innocence. I came home from overseas with three stab wounds in my head. And, um, okay, I can't control my emotions by this yet. So you have to excuse me if tears come in my eyes. I'm choking up, but I'm trying to catch I came home, police arrested me, coming down State Street. They arrested two other guys. They found the rare blood type of the victim on both of them with the man's wallet in their pocket. These guys confessed to doing it. They said it was going to kill me too because I had a military uniform on doing the civil rights years. I was in the Army and I believed in the Army. My family believed in the Army. I'm a Christian. So now, I was arrested and took to jail. The first killer who had kept admitting they did it was released from, from prison in 1980. The second killer was released from prison after he admitted it in 2000. They kept me in 2019, July. Nothing on me whatsoever but three stab wounds in my head. No medical treatment for this in my head. No, I had PTSD and didn't know it. 
I was just scared of everything is moving, so I caught a lot of tickets. I went to Tam Supermax for 12 years for being, I mean, I'm locked up for something I do, and I admit it, I got wild. I didn't believe in I could be locked up for something I didn't do. So I got wild. They put me in Tam Supermax, still no medical treatment. Until a few years ago. I gotta stop. No, no, come on. Yeah, yeah. Please, um, we, we, we got a camera. Go ahead and finish your story. Please. Until a few years ago, Menard Mental Health and Pinckneyville Mental Health diagnosed me with military-related PTSD. PTSD. And at that time, a good cop on the parole board finally did some investigation. And uh, thought he seen my innocence. And I got the United States to let me go. That's how I'm on the street right now. Okay. That's why I'm here. All right. Uh, are we done? Or can we yes, go to questions? Yeah, yeah, we can go to questions. Let's just stay up this. I think it's both of us, you know. All I'm right. Here. First one. Um, Ellen, I gotta commend you for starting to take your passion and boiling it down. Uh, two things. Can you tell me? I don't know a lot about the story, but it does sound like a good one. Uh, if Charlie agrees, I'd like to have you come back here sometime and do a whole night on the story. Uh, but, yes, Ellen, what brought you into this particular branch of the injustice? And for you, how does it feel to be out now? Well, for me, if I can ask you first. Sure. Throughout the 48 years, never lost my faith in God. Good. And when I got out here, which I thought I was going for life, I was doing 100 to 150 years. Wow. So it feels just so great. I'm not crying on sadness. I'm crying because it seemed like God had angels just lift me from the midst of the walking dead and put me back among the living. And that's how I smile so much. I'm a different person with medication. I'm just smiling. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy to be here. Okay. okay. I, I think I would say it's a spiritual path for me, too. I do think that, uh, you know, um, like working through, you know, the anger or whatever, the injustice of my family situation. And, but um, you do learn a lot. You know, I got an AA in 2000. But you learn a lot about the pain is the touchstone of your spiritual development. And what do you do with anger? You um, you kind of wake up the next morning and uh, but <clears throat> and think about somebody else. You know, it, it helps. Okay. Do we need a moderator tonight up there? Or <laughs> I think we're okay. 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 Then go ahead and which one next? Okay. What what, what did uh, the birds people do? What did the birds people do to you? Birds people put a gun on me, and they made me say that I was involved in the murder. He put the gun up on me and told me he's gonna kill me. He took me in a room, him and um, some other detectives with him, threatened to kill me again if I didn't talk to the prosecutor. When I see the prosecutor, I told the prosecutor I didn't know what they was talking about. I'm innocent of the case. And when they put me in the county jail, birds came true to his road. They had me stabbed in the back. He had me beat up in the county jail. I went to, uh, I got a history of getting medical treatment in the county jail. They had an investigation, yeah. I spoke on the investigation, but Burns got a lot of clout, even in the county jail. Uh, Cook okay, County Jail okay. Sheriff uh, Burke, I believe his name was, uh, the one that stabbed me and beat me, picked me up and stabbed me and beat me. I mean, just, it was a hell of a thing, but that was like that, because I did not confess to the crime that they wanted to. And the judge didn't want to hear none of it. All right. All right the but judge. I don't have a question because I just wanted to affirm some of the things that Ellen has just talked about because I've been to St. Leonard's and donated at St. Leonard's and um, it's a really, really interesting place. Um, I also have a good friend who's an innocent, wrong, wrongfully convicted over in Michigan and um, uh, thinking about how difficult it is to get an innocent man out of prison it's almost impossible. Uh, he was never supposed to have a parole hearing. I went to the parole hearing. There was the parole board. We were not to retry him. We were only to talk about whether he would be a good citizen if he came out. But the other side retried him. And one of their pieces of evidence was 
he was a high school student and he had rap lyrics in his locker that the prosecutor hated and they brought that up at his parole hearing and it was 15 years later. Um, so, so this is going to have to yeah, wait I for just, the rebuttal I period. Just wanted to, I just wanted to confirm the business about St. Leonard's and about the wrongful conditions okay. which I've had experience with. Okay. Next okay. questions please. I potentially may serve on a jury. Is there some way I could look for some identifier that would indicate that the defendant um, had a forced confession? Uh, I'll give you the case number. Oh. 71 12 67. But just in general. Uh, what would uh, another uh, person uh, on the jury look for? If, uh, what what think, indicators or, or are there any? Right. Uh, I, I'd like to say something about that because. Uh, they pick, they probably wouldn't put you on the jury. They put people who can't read, who don't know any, don't read the paper, who don't, you know, like are kind of asleep, don't care. That's what I observe. They, these are not like the 12 angry men people who are really trying to find justice. Um, Excuse me. They're, they're often very easily influenced. But um, I do think you can kind of see it that, um, there's, I mean, they don't let you hear the, the forced confession. You, you can tell it's fixed, then it's hard to hear. Um, they throw off, you can tell if people are starting to talk. They say, you're not allowed to talk to anybody, like with Laquan McDonald. If you do, they throw you out um, of the jury. You know, um, there's so many ways this thing is rigged from top to bottom. And so- um, You don't have anything to add to it? Yeah, well, one indicator for me, uh, which they do a lot. The judge offered me, the prosecutor offered me in front of the judge before this trial occurred, a uh, guilty plea. He said, if you plead guilty and point out these other two men and tell us something else they did, then we'll let you go. That's what they and did. I didn't know nothing about these other two guys. I didn't know what they did. So, and I wasn't, you know, so it, you I couldn't do it and I got the whole 150 years. Right there, Phil. Can't you see the state? Huh? Can't you sue them? Sue the state? Can we sue uh, the state? They told me, the parole board told me when I come out, they couldn't help me, but they, they encouraged me to come out, get a lawyer, and file a suit for doing that length of time in the prison without medical treatment. So it's cool to use a pumpkin and it's a wrongful conviction. Right here. Um, let, me, let me say something to that is we met a lawyer that, at the Alliance. Um, today at the talk and he's running yeah Daniel Epstein we should have him come talk here I met him at the Alliance because he he was there going this is crazy the DNA machines that they don't even use he said they give these guys a plea deal so um, he wanted to say you know you didn't even run the DNA machine you haven't run it in years and um, but the prosecutor says listen Take this plea deal. Say you did it. 98% of the people take a deal to something they didn't do, you know. Um, and because, and then you don't get a chance to say, and by the way, why are all the, you don't even use the DNA machines? And so these issues don't come out. But he's going to run for um, st for the Supreme Court um, of Illinois. Right here. And so look for that when the judge things come around. Uh, Question? Yes. Um, if I heard you correctly, you just got out of the penitentiary on July 2nd. Um, can you tell us what helped you to transition into society the way you have? Yes, ma'am. In addition to that, somebody talked about um, somebody in Michigan being wrongfully convicted. Can you help others? I'm a pair of as well. Oh, but yeah. What? How I transition? I was never a criminal. So, I mean, so it was an easy transition, just be myself. So in the last four years, while in prison, I almost did the impossible. I was elected uh, as, a, as a military veteran's chaplain for four years straight. I'm in Pinckneyville Correction Center. At that time, there's about four blacks as military veterans and over 50 some whites. And those guys voted me as their chaplain four years straight. Every year they kept voting me in. So I must have, I must have a good heart and a good, good personality for these guys to vote me in. Mm -hmm. uh, no racism. It was just straight across the board. We want the best man there, mm -hmm. and that's what I did. Right there. Yeah. Uh, one question, and I, I may have missed this along the lines. 
Uh, you were uh, jailed for, did you say, 45 years? 48 years. 48 years. Yes, what, what exactly, what exactly were you crimed, uh, what were you jailed for? Murder. You were, for murder? Murder. Okay. Uh, the reason I ask this is I have, I'm a newspaper reporter. Yes, sir. I've seen murderers yes, sir. go bye-bye uh, for five, six years. Right. You know, I would think that, you know, you would have had to commit high treason in order to get locked up for that kind of time. That's not true. Civil rights years. Back in 71, the civil rights years, and I'm black, and I, I just got dog for 150 years. They, they, they go for the good guys. I mean, these wrongful convictions, I think, are more egregiously, you know, 84 years is Mikkel Ward, you know, whereas um, Jason Van Dyke is uh, seven, right, and they're trying to get that dropped, you know, um, it's, they're, they're shameless, the, the FOP guys come and go, no, no accountability for us, no rules, we, we can shoot people, we can do whatever we want, we have total immunity. Impunity, and that's what's made them monsters, you know. Um, Next question. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Next question, please. If there are no questions, we'll go. Okay, right here. Uh, I have a question. Uh, roughly, there. I've heard or read that there are roughly two million people in prisons in the United States. Uh, both of you have stated that a lot of those people shouldn't be there. What percent or what proportion of the people that are in jail do you feel actually should be there? Maybe it's none. Okay. What's your yes, answer? Prisons are needed for some people. Child molesters, kill, or, or rapists, even killers. Prisons are needed for serial killers and stuff like that. However, as a paralegal, I've read thousands of cases, and I've seen so many people that were actually innocent by the facts in those cases. And that's what I'm here to stand up for. I was a military vet, and other military vets in prison right now that I know of that suffer PTSD and they're not receiving any treatment for it at all. And that's what drives me right now to, to reach back and try to get those innocent people and those military vets that are suffering without treatment because I don't see not giving treatment. I want to help those guys, and I'm, I'm here to help. Them. I have I talked to the um, innocence after life after innocence uh, that out of Loyola. There's quite a few, and um, this Laura Caldwell. We should get her to come in. She, uh, I, you know, they. I heard some of these exonerees talking, and and I said, well, how many are there? She said they estimate one third of the people in there, and you know, um, but the the they maintain that they don't have to give us the statistics, the data. I want to demand the data. We have the right to hold these people accountable through data. Right over there, sir. Yeah. Thank um, you. Supposedly, um, aren't the interrogations uh, videotaped? Of course, yours happened before that time, I think, that the statute went in. At least have wrongful convictions diminished since um, no. those reforms? No. no. I took a young man's case, a post-conviction petition on him. Now we had to fax the police reports on him. They did uh, have him on, on camera when it was a, a video camera while he was confessing. But when they cut the camera off, that's when the really problem began. Hitting him in the head with books, beating him, making him say something. Then they cut it back on when they waited for the state. It's not only a continuous. Look at that uh, movie with the Central Park Five, When They Hear Us. Uh, this is a great new movie, Ava DuVernay. Um, look at Making of Murder. The pattern in practice is so obvious when you see these movies. Uh, the um, to Hill Browder story, uh, it's always the same. And the ones that have, the horse really oh, don't sorry. want okay. to I know. admit they're, you know, didn't do it. And so they they get beat up by, I mean, it's just <coughs> horrifying how um, right over there. the oh. treatment they get. Hi, uh, in all your talk, in all your research, did you run across uh, the concept that we have more people in prison in this country because it's really profitable? It's a, a lot of prisons are for profit. And yeah. They make a lot of money keeping guys incarcerated. Yes, yeah. well, I, yes, I did. Mm -hmm. What's yeah, the difference between I'm here and like I'm Norway? In Norway or Sweden or some other country that doesn't well, have a for profit system? Yeah. Well, 
It's um, I think it's much better in Norway. This this place is one of the worst corrupt justice systems you gonna ever find. The United States is part of Russia, Russia and Russia, and I don't like Russia at all. But the U.S. is just they hide the stupid things in the world. They know what they're doing so wrong. I build that side. I see what happens. It's so corrupt that they can protect themselves um, from the very top. But I was pushing. And as soon as Donald Trump was elected and uh, they said, Jeff Sessions, I said, are you going to try to do a consent decree where the judge will hold this accountable? And they go, no, Jeff Sessions already told us. Lori Lightfoot told me this herself. He's already made it. There will be no consent decree in Chicago. This is their, you know, mafia play. Um, right there in the back. Yes, how many people in prison would you say are there because who really are mentally ill and really to be in some kind of mental treatment and not prison. Yeah, well, there are thousands. They closed the crazy houses down. I hate to use that term. And put those guys as criminally insane and put them in prison with us. And they just locked them in there. So now, without no treatment, the psych ain't really giving them the sleeping pills. So they still, they just still crazy. <laughs> it's a bunch of them. It's a bunch of even though they turned a, a crazy house for doing into prison. Uh, and then I, I wanted to add something. I was a, tried to get an internship as a drug and alcohol counselor, and I went to one of the ones they let me go to. Turns out it's owned by Geo Group, you know? So they take the mental health places, and there's like nobody there, and they don't give me the internship because I'm a whistleblower type. Uh, so it's it comes from right the here. top. You you mentioned O.J. Simpson. Do do you really believe he's not guilty? Of which crime? Of the Maybe big crime, murdering crime. his wife. The second crime. No, the second crime he's not guilty. I, uh, yeah. That's the one. I would okay, but the first crime, I where know. all these jurors said he's not guilty. Okay. Bullshit. I believe in the first and the second crime, where he, I think it happened in Las Vegas. Yeah. 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 That's the case. I okay, think. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. He's trying to right. steal his own trophy. Right there. Yeah. Yeah. Sound right. yeah. Uh, this may or may not be uh, relevant, <clears throat> but. Before you were arrested, yes, sir. Uh, and even afterwards, did you have any particular individuals like cops on the beat or whatever that, for one reason or another, had it in for you and would have been glad to see you off the streets again for one reason or another? Because you don't strike me as the sort that would have a very significant record, if at all. Right. Well, let me explain. The civil rights years is when. There was a lot of racial tension. And by me being black, I'm home from the army, and being black, period, and it's all white cops, it was easy to get me and frame me uh, for that murder. So they didn't care who they got as long as the color was a different color. And that's how I got caught up. This one guy at St. Leonard's told me that he pointed to Kilroy, another wrongful, and he said, they picked the good guys to do this in is, you know, the wrongful conviction. He goes, I, I meant, you know, it, he went to jail for a real reason, but he he said a lot of these guys really were so upstanding. And I, it's kind of a form of terrorism to, um, to say they can put anybody they want, no matter how honorable, no matter how good, they can do it to them and they'll do it to you if you don't respect their power. Yeah, yeah Alan, you said there's some kind sort of Nazi influence or agents have permeated every police department. Are you speaking figuratively, administratively? No, I, literally, really, the, the like I said, Reinhard Gellin, his, Hitler's head of intelligence, uh, worked with Alan Dulles, the first D, you know, of the director of the CIA in 1948, and John Foster Dulles, his brother, and they or he put him in charge of the Gellin Group, which is now the West German CIA, right? And so that group, then they, all this is out with the CIA, but the Project Mockingbird, I mean, so they basically have infiltrated and it works with the Ku Klux Klan. I mean, there's always been an overlap between the Bush family funded Hitler and the Nazis, right? And um, with the Ford factories, so all this research is there, but um, so these are literally Nazis, and they use the techniques. This is why at Abu Ghraib, it looks just like the Nazis went and trained the the various the Muslim Brotherhood. They torture them, and 
and then use them as weapons. And so torture, it was actually Operation Gladio, um, but NATO, Gladio, Team B, Sybil Edmonds exposed all this, is that they decided uh, Carl Schmidt, who was Hitler's crown jury, his judge, his, came up with the Reichstag fire, came up with the, the strategy of tension. Type that into the computer. You know, um, they, Carl Schmidt uh, said, let's divide and conquer the world with terrorist attacks. You know, starting with what there's Spain and Iran. And, so that's why they, how they use terrorism and what they've done, Operation Phoenix in Vietnam, John Burge was trained to do that. Um, Zuli was trained to do that. They, uh, they're they using the techniques like they did COINTELPRO on Mark, um, what's his name, the Black Panther. Uh, they, it's a, it, Mark, yeah, Mark Clark and Fred Hampton. They, um, this is, you know, they look for the messiahs. Mark, um, the FBI went after Martin Luther King, John F. Kennedy, um, Bobby Kennedy. They were behind all those assassinations. And it, this is all a way to terrorize us. You know, most people just go, I can't handle that. Let's not talk about politics or religion. And um, they silence us. They, uh, you know, you give up, right? Be controlled. And this is the same technique that Carl Schmidt taught, used in Hitler's era time. They fake the, uh, the Reichstag fire, blame it on a communist, and then use that as a reason to wage war on, on them. You know, they did that with 9-11. They did that with uh, the Gulf of Tonkin in Vietnam. They do a false flag attack, and then that's the way they start a war. And they, it's, um, it's just this old Nazi technique. Okay, over there, Linda. Um, Ellen, as a whistleblower and an activist, <clears throat> are you ever concerned for your own safety because you're dealing with people challenging their careers and their integrity and so do you worry about your safety? I, I really don't. You know, um, I, I think if I get killed doing this, I'll be proud of myself. You know, we're going to go one day, but you got to do that to be a saint, right? But, um, you know, also one thing I learned is I talking to this, I've got this great guy, Ron ja Jackson, who we went up for um, Razmia O'Day was a Palestinian being sent out of Detroit for being an activist organizer. But as he pointed out, they don't go after white ladies, you know. Um, you know, and so when we had a, they were marching. I looked at the, the Palestinian guys. I said, we just put the, the white people in front of the lines and the police go, Ooh, you know, like this. They back off. So I, I think, you know, who knows? They might go after me, but I doubt it. I Right there. I, I didn't respond properly to his question. I thought about what he said about any harm against me. I never thought about it until he just asked me that. There is a situation. Wait, 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 wait. What question are you responding to? He asked me a question about did I do anything to make any police mad at me in Chicago when they caused me harm? And that I was this guy here. Uh, that was him? Yeah. So I didn't properly respond to it. But there, there is something that may be, I'm not for sure, but while in South Korea, while in South Korea, I was assigned on a special mission to assist some, uh, 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 some U.S. officials. The lowest rank on the captain, the highest, the admiral in general. They was captured on a military gathering intelligence ship in North Korean waters in 1968. So now when they got released, I was assigned to go safely escort them from the helicopters at 121 Evacuation Hospital. And I went. And I succeeded that group, that, that, that mission, to safely, but they told me some things. And I was told never to talk about those things that I never have. I'm not trying to get killed. I never have talked about it. Let it on yeah. TV, I still haven't talked about it. So if that was a thing where they thought I talked about it, that could have been the reason to. Yeah. I've never talked about anything. Yeah, it's a Question. secret mission. Other, right there, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Our uh, former uh, mayor, uh, Richard uh, Daly Jr., was a uh, state's attorney during a lot of this stuff that happened. Yeah. yeah. So, do you think, uh, well, how much uh, of his hands were uh, dirty uh, by this uh, uh, police brutality stuff? It was muddy, with mud and blood. Mm -hmm. He was a crooked man. Mm -hmm. He's a really right. crooked man. And that's why they protected at the top. And that's interesting also, Richard J. Daly was around for this red summer. In 1919, he was one of the gangsters. And so you see how this Ku Klux Klan culture 
works, right? That there's a silence and, you know, they, the white guys never are impunity, total impunity. They help birds. Right. They, the whole system protects them, and that, that's a given, unfortunately. That's can, can you prove that your descendants were born in Jamestown? I'm working. I, yeah, you do have to prove it, but I'm pretty sure I can. Yeah. I'm, Any other questions? Tough. All right. Okay. Uh, you also, at an earlier session, now that we talked about Jamestown, at an earlier session indicated that you were a relative of uh, Anne Boleyn. Right, right. Yeah. Well, no, no. Um, Thomas Wyatt. The name is Wyatt. Uh, Sir Thomas Wyatt. Um, so Francis Wyatt was the governor, and Hal Wyatt was my ancestor. But, okay, so you're, you're but not they were on the they were on the stand with Anne Boleyn. Thomas Wyatt wrote the first English sonnet about her. And was, okay, so we're not cousins after all. <laughs> you're related to Anne Boleyn. Uh, Distantly. Distantly. Yeah, Christopher Boleyn, who is you know a great whistleblower <coughs> on for 9/11, uh, he's he's related to Anne Boleyn. I think it's funny. There, you are, know, there are a lot of people related to a lot of people. Yeah, well, yeah. It, it's interesting. I've done ancestry, and I've just joined the Colonial Dames, and so based on proven most of that, and my mother always said, yeah, we were. And so now with the ancestry, you can prove it. It's right. pretty easy. Okay, yeah. Right here. A uh, young black man who is innocent is arrested for a heinous crime while he's walking down the street. What should he do? Is there a guide or what? What should he? What is there a guide or a? What should he do? What are yeah. his? You better do what I got to do. Stop playing and hope you come out of prison alive before it's too late. It's not funny, but that's what he got to do, pray to God. Because this, this corrupt system here, he'll be lucky to make it out like I was. In 150 right. years when I'm out here, I kept my faith in God. You got to keep it in there and stay strong. But before he's been convicted, what can he do to decrease his odds of... You better hope you have a good lawyer. All right. But he's been picked up already, you say, because they should be quiet, right? Don't say anything. Call this number and call me. Mm -hmm. What what number would a would a would this this number would be person seven seven three seven zero nine zero one four zero. That's Eugene Horton. Mm -hmm. uh, call me. I know how that system go. I'll find the right legal team to get with him. But we, she fit open the office real soon for me. And I'll be the man's office. We'll bring lawyers and paralegals in. I know how they, I know what to look for in these mm -hmm. big cases. I've been experienced, I experienced this. So I suggest him call me. I've been through what he finna go through. He need my help to avoid it. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I, I think, yeah, the best offense, defense is a good offense. And that's, yes. that's what motivates me. Uh, and that, that actually helped one of this James Gibson get out that Robert Milan, uh, the state's attorney, trying to take over, he was working under Daly and Devine. He, um, I read, you can be as dirty and corrupt as you, were, as you want, can't help it. But if you're outside your jurisdiction, um, that is, you, he can be sued and, and, and exposed. And so he, he is, his job is to defend the city of Chicago against the Burge trials. But he does it by prosecuting the people. And that is, Two jurisdictions that's highly conflicted, and so I'm trying to get that in right up front in the headlines, and they're trying to stop me. Last question over here, Governor. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, what about all the police uh, that were uh, associated with John Birch? Have any of them been brought to trial? You know, Many of them, I'm sure, would be just as guilty as Burge. Yeah. They worked under him, they worked with him. I think that for them to get away is as bad as letting Burge get away. Right. Let me address that. The wrongful conviction thing right now is being handled by prosecutors, uh, and they really stupid things under the world. Anytime you put a prosecutor in charge of determining who got wrong to convicted, then it ain't gonna happen too much because there ain't, ain't nothing gonna happen. They're gonna sweep it under the rug, and that's what's been going on with a lot of these cases. They just leave them in there. They delay the trial. They they just wink, and they, it's like the defense and the prosecutors are both kind of 
Don't we, worry about we it. We need an independent person over there, not the prosecutor. It's be the prosecutor calls him being locked up in the first place. So we're not gonna hold it against himself. Mm -hmm. It's unfair to get a prosecutor to take our charge charge this case. Another thing before we mm -hmm. close it up. I'm looking for a storefront office. If I would like to get one in this area. And if I do, I'll be here any day you want me to come here. Okay. Every day you want me to. <laughs> so if you see a storefront, it's a value we're here, let us know. We are ready. And we're, no problem. We're going to raise some funds, too, I think, like at these fundraisers or GoFundMe, or, um, because it is an important cause, and I think people will, will get behind us. Um. How many comments? Who wants a comment? Rebuttal. 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 And then we'll come up after. Please stop. Okay. Right. That's a good response. Ten people, eleven people. We have about uh, twelve people. Maybe four minutes. I think. Four minutes. Your first. All right. Who's Andy? Can you time, please? I got the time. Okay. So many questions that came up I have experience with. Someone said to uh, Mr. Horton, "How could you uh, come out so well?" And I had a friend, Dennis Williams, uh, he died, uh, but he was wrongfully convicted. Uh, he was one of the Ford Heights Four, and he was, appeared at Northwestern and was talking to the students, and they asked him the same question, and he says, these are his exact words, you just don't understand the power of innocence, and uh, the, because he came out of jail, and just he was just a regular guy. Um, and then Tim to Christopher, who went to jail for um, uh, <laughs> for messing up an illegal sale? It was an illegal sale of parcels in Utah uh, of um, uh, uh, it, it was land parcels that they were selling off to uh, fossil fuel companies, and it was a totally illegal sale. And he went in there as a buyer when he didn't have a dime. And um, he messed up the whole sale, and everybody got mad at him. And then they prosecuted him. And he was in prison for a while. And when he came out, I heard him speak, and he said, um, there were some people who belonged in prison. And he said, uh, some of them were the actual prisoners, but most of them were the guards. Yeah. And, uh, and then, my, uh, th then I worked for David Protest at Northwestern, and um, he yeah. said, uh, that, that, that people who are in jail and keep protesting their innocence year after year after year. He said they're innocent because eventually people begin to brag about what they've done. And uh, so the ones who have been in prison a long time, they're going to start talking about their exploits. And, um, and I also want to recommend the movie, Who Shall We Invade Next? Did anybody see that? And yes. and uh, Michael Moore. Ra what's his name? Moore. His Michael Moore. Michael Moore goes to I think it was Norway yeah. and explains the prison system in Norway, and he says we need to invade Norway so we can adopt their prison system. So I I just thought I'd throw those things out because you know my real prep, my real subject is nuclear power, and I wanted to talk about um, a, an element. Here's a picture of the periodic table. And over on this side, right in this first row of the periodic table, way over on the left, you've got lithium, sodium, potassium, and cesium. And they're all, they all have similar chemical uh, characteristics. And the one that's the bad one is cesium-137. And there was a lot of that dumped out of Chernobyl. And I wanted to tell you something about cesium-137. Uh, there's phenomenal amounts of radioactivity at Chernobyl. Uh, Indian Point has cesium-137, and 50% of the activity at Indian Point is cesium-137. There's a metric ton of it there. Chernobyl released 50 kilograms, and it's 44 curies per gram. 44 curies of radiation per gram. Uh, a, a gram is the weight of a dollar bill. There's a million dollar bills out there. 37 million disintegrations every second. And it's a long-term land contamination. It's a radiotoxic in small amounts. Um, the exi uh, this was a LP hatch in, on January 30th of 1959. What's that? 70 years ago, he said, 
The existence of large quantities of radioactive waste can contaminate. If we reach an impasse and we have been doing the wrong thing with the waste, nothing can be done for centuries. Um, and I just wanted you to understand the quantity. One gram of cesium-137 puts out 37 million disintegrations every second. Can you say who David Protest is? Excuse oh. me. Mm -hmm. Move. We got it. We got people. Are you talking about? Okay. You'll have to meet after. Uh, we talked about two topics, free speech and prisons. Uh, they're a bit different. I just want to recommend the book by Michelle Alexander, The New Jim Crow. Uh, the church that I'm in, uh, Second Unitarian, a bunch from that church read that book together uh, several years ago. I would recommend reading that book. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I've known uh, Ellen for a good while, and I know her to be a person of good heart and of highest integrity, and uh, I think you can probably uh, uh, believe her in these matters, and I think this confirms what a lot of us knew. Thank you. Uh, I've been out on the uh, front I've been with her, with refused fascism on a few occasions, and uh, also I've been out on occasions where uh, a rally or protest was just uh, called on account of police brutality and police injustice. Um, and this um, today informed me that the problem is even more serious than I ever imagined. Estimates of a quarter to a third of the people incarcerated in this country being unjustly convicted are so outrageous and so beyond the pale that um, it just uh, it strikes me to the heart that this is a a horrible, horrible justice system and uh, needs to be fixed somehow. Um, I would, if I was in charge, I'd order a review of every single case that ever came through this justice system and have no conflicts of interest. It's quite obvious that prosecutors are involved in making any of these decisions. That's ridiculous on the face of it. Um, conflicts of interest uh, should not be allowed in any kind of a system like this. Um, it's just a, a, a complete, uh, it, it's just such a complete travesty um, that we must do something about it. Um, earlier today I was at Buck House uh, Square uh, like Ellen and uh, I made a, a pitch for uh, protests uh, in the street of large numbers of people and uh, of long duration uh, to try to at least uh, combat the, uh, uh, from the top we have this horrible vibe coming down from Trump, the Trump-Pence fascist regime uh, and Trump with his um, offhand comments where supposedly his hands will be free but he's instructing police to rough suspects up when they get in the van. Well, how is that justice? Uh, how is that in any way to find out the truth of the matter, you're roughing people up before they've even seen a hearing room or anything of the kind. It is just so outrageous, and we're in such dire danger in our society of going over to a totalitarian dictatorship in which, uh, well, no one will be safe. I mean, obviously, activists have been persecuted on numerous occasions. Ellen's seen the signs of that. Uh, her life. I'm lucky it hasn't happened to me. Only one instance when I was uh, at a petition, uh, I was with the Citizens Party for a candidate. The Citizens Party was a liberal, very liberal uh, left party. Uh, Barry Commoner was the initial candidate for president, and I was uh, petitioning. And the police just decided on no conceivable pretext to pat me down. If they had been in the interest of planting marijuana on me or something like that, I could have had an experience similar to yours, sir. Uh, not as bad, but uh, certainly a terrible circumstance. And I uh, have gone with this trauma of the police um, without any pretext for reasonable searching me. They actually patted me down and put me in the fear of, of an unjust 
conviction and ruining my life. So I experienced that briefly. Luckily, I have white privilege, obviously. Um, I have a, uh, a great deal of guilt from that. But uh, I uh, appreciate your ordeal, sir. Yes, sir. My heart goes out to you. And uh, I hope that some good can come of this. I, I respect that you are not coming out here to talk of revenge or that uh, uh, or anything like that. And thank you very much for your story. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is David Travis. Uh, speaking from the point of view of, of a man who had a personal encounter with John Burge, I have to say that John Burge was, was a piece of dirt of the lowest order. Uh, I can honestly attest to this. Uh, and when I heard that John Burge had died, I uh, sat down and had a shot of whiskey. I felt so good about that in celebration. The, the man, but, but what I want to point out, though, is that those police officers that were associated with him, that uh, <laughs> acted under his orders and uh, beat confessions out of people and made them uh, say things that were untrue, they're just as bad as John Burge. And they should uh, be uh, uh, prosecuted uh, to the fullest extent of the law. Uh, I've seen uh, injustice among the police. Uh, I used to have a, uh, a storefront on Milwaukee Avenue, and there were some uh, Indian people that had uh, a store next to mine. They had a grocery store. And there were some little girls that would come in and pester the, the guy's son that worked there. And he um, told them, OK, that's enough. You have to go now. And he went like this on one of their hind ends for them to get, get going, because he had work to do in the store. And uh, within, within minutes, there were several paddy wagons and police cars there, and they arrested the guy and said that he had fondled one of the little girls, and that he took indecent liberties with her. And, uh, oh, these pe the parents of these little girls were police. And they didn't like the guy because he was a Hindu, or Indian anyway, and they, um, they arrested him and took him in and uh, made this guy's life totally miserable. And then, just for a little personal revenge, about every two or three weeks at about 4.30 in the morning, somebody would put a brick through the guy's window. Mm. And this happened about every two or three weeks, about five times. Now, I can honestly attest to the injustice that was done here, because they used to give me tickets all the time, even if I didn't have one coming, because I wasn't Irish. So these kind of things happen, and uh, those police got away with murder. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to wish you a great deal of luck. What is your name? It's important. Good luck. I just wanted to say that uh, Good luck. Our, our guest speaker is, uh, I'm impressed that he's such a alert, intelligent, uh, for, but someone who's been in jail for 48 years. You know, my impression of jail is just getting worse. I mean, I mean you just deteriorate. I'm very uh, impressed with him. Anyway, uh, I was going to say about uh, freedom, freedom of speech, and in many of our colleges and universities, students are taught to hate America. Yeah. And uh, uh, 
Leftists continue to portray mainstream conservative speech as hate speech and inherently racist, sexist, sexist, and homophobic. Campuses are, campuses are imposing speech codes empower, empowering bias squads to, to <clears throat> detect and, 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 and punish offensive language and allowing leftist, leftist mobs to drive the, the controversial speakers from campus. Now this happened uh, when I, I went to see uh, Trump. He was uh, appearing at, at the U of I, and Atifa was there, and a lot of other uh, groups, and he had to cancel. And a lot of left uh, conservative speakers have to have to cancel because the, these leftists are attacking them. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, uh, tr tr uh, President Trump soon will sign an executive order to uh, require colleges and universities to support free speech if they want federal research funds, right. which, which amounts to $35 billion. That's a lot of money. So they better get on the ball. Thanks, Ella, for your activism and to bring in uh, Mr. Horton. And uh, I really commend you for looking so good and sounding so good and sensible for a man who's been in jail for 48 years for no good reason. Uh, I think probably very few of us would be in such good shape and uh, as sensible as you seem to be. <clears throat> um, I actually have a few comments to make <clears throat> about my last uh, presentation. And we're free to uh, speak about anything, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, because uh, there's some a little bit of unfinished business. I was a little bit discom discombobulated at the end. I didn't respond properly to some of your rebuttals. Um, so, for whatever reasons, I'm not going to get into it, but <clears throat> uh, I brought in uh, solid scientific proof of bakery in the hoaxing in the moon program. Uh, as you all recall, I'm not going to explain it again, but I showed that there was no orbital motion when the uh, spacecraft reached the moon. It was not in orbit. It stopped literally dead in space, which is impossible. And I explained how the <clears throat> sand and dust being kicked up by the rover wheels showed uh, um, motion uh, that was in an atmosphere. Okay, and I explained that clearly uh, with illustrations, explanations. So I think any ten-year-old, okay, would have understood this. Um, when you all came to rebut my presentation, and several of you did, I mean negatively, um, not. One of you said one word about the evidence that I brought in uh, of hoaxing, of fakery. You all seem to be, many of you seem to be utterly, as, as Andy keeps on saying, utterly immune to evidence, to science, okay? Um, so, <clears throat> what, what, now what you did say, uh, several of you, was, okay, uh, well, uh, the Russians accepted the moon landing, apparently, or at least that's the claim, that's what you claimed. I'm not so sure about that, but let's say, say for the sake of argument that that's correct. They didn't uh, reveal the hoax. They didn't rat out the Americans on the hoax. Therefore, the landing must have been true. <laughs> say what? Uh, that is conjecture. Okay, that is speculation. That is not a fact. That is fact-free opinion. You bring that in down here uh, to counter my evidence? No, that doesn't work, okay? Uh, imagine, <clears throat> and by the way, the Russians would have uh, had uh, any number of reasons to cover up their own uh, shenanigans in their own space program. Uh, there's evidence that uh, they did some fakery and co cover-ups of killing people uh, before Yuri Gagarin went up. Okay, he might not have even been the first guy up. Uh, but of course, you don't investigate those kinds of things because you're, you're, not, you're not interested in facts. <clears throat> so this would be like um, a going to a court. You go into a courtroom, mm -hmm. and you're defending these criminals. and um, you say to the judge, okay, Your Honor, uh, and, and ladies and gentlemen of the jury, here are, here are uh, the defendants. I, 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 I'm defending them. <clears throat> um, but you see, they can't be guilty because this other criminal gang did not rat them out. That is the level of logic that you all are involved in, okay? Uh, <clears throat> several of you said that, well, um, you know, we, we went up many times, and not just once or twice. The hopes would have been established after one or two times. But we kept on going, um, and so therefore, it must have all been true. There's no logic there. I mean, there's very little logic, and whatever is in there is fact 
free. That is, again, speculation, pure conjecture. Okay. Um, so apparently facts in this uh, forum, uh, to many of you, don't, <laughs> don't matter. A couple of you threw out a couple of uh, bogus anti-facts uh, uh, concerning WTC, uh, excuse me, concerning 9-11, like the World Trade Center towers were hollow. That is disinformation. That is bullcrap. One or two minutes research would have shown you that, that, that the towers had stronger steel cores than the, than the strong outer cores, than the strong outer walls. Okay? You gotta look into, you gotta uh, respect facts, informa actual information. Don't throw out crap, okay? What about cartoons? You talk about cartoons. Uh, one more thing, one more thing to uh, finish up. Uh, one of you said, okay, building uh, seven burned up and came down because of fires. Mm -hmm. It is a fact established beyond uh, 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 question that steel towers do not burn up. There are many fires, of, much uh, worse fires, of uh, steel towers not coming down, and they built uh, the tower, the building up again uh, over the standing undamaged steel frame. Okay, so please do a little bit of research, do a little bit of honest uh, 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 thinking, okay, or do some thinking at all. Steel melts. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Sometimes it is a phrase, and sometimes it isn't a grudge. Sometimes it's just a desire on the part of, and this is true in every city, on the part of law enforcement officials to get the slate cleaned up and get the books cleared up so that you can go home and say you've done a good job. Case in point, uh, about uh, 12 years ago, I was an extra uh, in a, in a uh, series that didn't last very long, uh, Angel Street. I was to play the part of a desk sergeant. I'm on my way uh, to the south side location, and all of a sudden, three squad cars pull up in front of me, two in front, one in back, and they want me to hold my hands up, which I did immediately. And apparently someone remotely resembling me had escaped from the Illinois State Psychiatric Institute. What'd you say? Now, there are many people here and elsewhere who would say, well, they probably had the right man. Uh, and they said, can you vouch for who you are? And I said, yes, and I can give you several references. And they said, who would that be? And I said, well, Joseph DeLeonardi, the former superintendent of the police force, you're familiar with him, gentlemen. And uh, there was a bishop whose name I uh, included in that uh, list, and uh, also a uh, retired admiral. And they looked at me like I indeed was nutty, and I reached into my pocket and says, gentlemen, I'm slowly going to open up my pocket and I'm going to give you uh, their cards. And so, and I invite you to check and hold me as long as necessary until after you have checked them out and verified my references. Uh, one of them will attest uh, at least that uh, I may appear nuts, but I'm really not. Uh, anyway, that was the vision. Uh, anyway, they held me for about 15 minutes while they checked out. They came back, faces red. Mr. Butler, sir, is there any place we can take you? Uh, we've inconvenienced you enough. We're sorry we got the wrong man. Now, if I hadn't had those three references, I probably would still be in the Illinois State, uh, State Psychiatric Institute. And I probably would have deserved to be there by that time. <laughs> because I surely would have lost my mind uh, by then if I hadn't lost it beforehand. The point of the matter is, sometimes you have a situation where people just get a little bit sloppy in doing the job. I'm not talking about Burge, who uh, got you know, his jollies out of doing the things that he did. I'm talking about guys who at 5 o'clock, you know, think, well, let's clear up the books and, and go home and we've done a good job. That kind of thing. Uh, it can happen. And for that, I blame the supervisors. 
Uh, if anything needs to be done in the way of police reform, uh, I can tell you because as a reporter, I've, I've you know worked in more than a few police stations from time to time, uh, <coughs> gathering up information for stories, and I can tell you some of these guys do get sloppy. Uh, it happens, and the guys that are supposed to be their bosses, that's their job to make sure that these guys don't get sloppy. So. If we're talking about police reform, which we kind of were in this whole thing, we're talking about a lot of reform, we also have to look at the fact that there are some people that just aren't uh, as careful as they ought to be. And there is where you need a sergeant or a lieutenant to jump down their back and make sure that they do their job that they were sworn to do. And uh, I was lucky. Uh, many of you who know me would, would, as I say, say that, you know, well, you belong to the asylum. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, I was lucky. I was white. I was wearing clean, uh, well-pressed clothes, the whole thing, shine shoes. You knew the right people. And, you know, I didn't look like, I didn't look like the typical troublemaker. But I was. Anyway, and I still am. <laughs> Thank you, Eugene, and thank you, Ellen. Like an inner tube on the big blue, big blue wave splash. We're in our winning move, and we're getting through from way back. Sister, brother, we remember you. We're still on a mission whose roots are made grass. A vision of our youth was a whisper. Now it's a tuba parade at last. We the peeps are blooming in mass. We the peeps are moving so fast. Remember what was the only room we had. We're not begging, not suggesting, not requesting, we're taking a stand. Not recommending or pumping string spending, we're enacting our demands. Because justice don't wait for an approval stamp. As a people on the planet, it's we who make it happen. We're the generation who's going to make it happen so it lasts. Freedom Foundation comes first, that's the way to move forward. Who taught me that? You taught me that. Freedom comes first, that's the way to move onward. Who taught me that? You taught me that. Most of the greatest evils that man has inflicted upon man have come through people feeling quite certain about something which in fact is false. That's Bertrand Russell from Unpo Popular Essays. And he also said uh, more about that topic. He said, fear is the main source of superstition and one of the main sources of cruelty. To conquer fear is the beginning of wisdom. Our collective fear stimulates herd instinct and tends to produce ferocity towards those who are not regarded as members of the herd. The demand for certainty is one which is natural to man but is nevertheless an intellectual vice. So long as humans are not trained to withhold judgment in the absence of evidence, they will be led astray by cocksure prophets and it is likely that their leaders will be either ignorant fanatics or dishonest charlatans to endure uncertainty is difficult, but so are most of the other virtues. Uh, this evening, once again, we the people on a spider web string budget had a victory where uh, one of our uh, best brothers and one of our best sisters gave us yet again an intellectual, a verbal, and a soul self defense against the cocksure prophets and the ignorant fanatics and the dishonest charlatans of the dominant system, and we are all better off for it. Thank you, Ellen, and thank you, Eugene. All right, Jonathan, when you're ready, get out of the way of the camera, please. You know, I too have had some rather bad experience with the police myself, particularly back in 1989 when uh, there was a whole bunch of, I call it the Pizzagate scandal, when uh, I delivered pizzas and, they, and the police department got its half off discount revoked because of uh, a drunken sergeant demanding it when he was off and the he got the owner mad. Well, 
42 tickets resolved from us with the pizza drivers as they were getting us for things like rolling stops and very minor technical violations. I myself got eight tickets in one month, and I had a clear driving record way before that. As it was in front of the judge, you know, he asked me, what are you going to do about this? I have to file a lawsuit. I mean, this stuff is crazy. There's no way. And I told the judge what happened. I looked at the prosecuting attorney for Lake in the Hills and talked, conferred with him. The judge came back. He says, double secret probation. Well, anyway, but you know, despite that, you know, after talking to the police chief of Lake in the Hills, was making a little raucous at the station, they backed off. And uh, over the previous few years, I've had several positive encounters with the police department. In particular, there was one incident where I had a traffic accident. And, you know, I was kind of shaken up. The cars were totaled. They were towed away. And the sergeant gave me, a, you know, the sergeant who was there gave me a ride back to my apartment and we chat a little bit. You know, I was guilty of the ticket and all that stuff. But I actually wrote a letter to the police department, to his boss, saying that the guy was very friendly, he did his job well, and that, uh, you know, I wanted to recommend him for, for, for uh, you know, promotion, knowing that coming from a civilian out of the blue like that would be very, would be counted very highly with his review. And uh, I never really heard from the officer again, but I hope that letter did something, because in that particular case, he did a really excellent job. Also, fairly recently, uh, you know, I was at a Morton's gas station in Algonquin, and two cops came in and, uh, hey, how you doing? I said, I'm fine. I'm just, what, what happened? I'm going to buy you a cup of coffee today, make a real positive impression on you. I said, good, well, thank you. And a couple of times thereafter, some of these police officers have shown very good will and very good things on the thing. So I'm not going to say that all people are corrupt. And I think that we tend to remember the corrupt, the bad things, but forget all the good things that police officers and law enforcement do. They are there to serve and protect, and I think most of them are there to do just that. And for me to sit here and, you know, I've had some bad, I've had some good, I think generally that most of those guys who swore that oath out of the police academy really mean to live it and want to do a good job. And again, I do believe sometimes there is a little bit of a corrupting influence with some old-time sergeants and things like that. But, you know, the things that we have here are nothing new. We all know of Hinky Dink and what's the other guy's name from uh, the two guys, the bathhouse guys, who are they? Uh, Coughlin? What is it? Hinky Dink and Hinky Dink and uh, Coughlin. Okay. Bathhouse Jack Coughlin and his uh, sidekick, uh, Hinky Dink. And then, of course, too, we had the famous novel of Serpico from the New York Police Department. We go back to Tammany Hall in New York City in the early 18th century where the political cartoon got born. Corruption's nothing new. And as a matter of fact, Chicago has been known for it for years. But you do have to understand one thing. The lights get turned on, the streets get cleaned up, and we, you know, if we want to reform it, we have to keep on it. I thank God I live in a country where we have investigative reporters. I thank God we live in a country that has civil rights. I thank God we live in a country that something like what happened to you can happen and be out. And I want to say, you know, our, our country may not be, you know, the most perfect place. But, you know, we have a history of reconciliation. We have a history of self-examination. We have a history of reform, and therefore, I am a proud American. Thank you. Yes, Charlie. Yeah. Thanks, I'll take a look. I'm grateful that Ellen invited us here. Sure. 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 I'm grateful that um, Mr. Eugene Horton insisted that I come. 
because I was tired, at least that's what I said, right? Um, it was interesting to hear you both speak. Um, so I'd like to let you know that if you'd like to continue to hear Mr. Eugene Horton speak Sunday, tomorrow, July 18th, he'll be on WVON 1690. July 28th. Did I say July 28th? You said 18th. Oh, pardon me, thank you. July 28th, Sunday, tomorrow, at 7 p.m. on WVON 1690. He will be the guest of a community activist, Maureen Forte. So, um, and I'd also like to let you know that um, the torture ma machine by Flint Taylor. Have you ever heard of Flint Taylor? Mm -hmm. Well, he's a fighting attorney mm -hmm. for those who, you know, have had some kind of conflict with the police. For me, it was a challenging book to read. I only got through chapter one because it's very graphic, very graphic. And I wanted to read the book because my mother's name is indexed in the book. And so is my brother. But I could not finish that book. I could only read chapter one. So if you're up for some details, some gore, because police brutality is not a pretty thing. Um, and I wanted to say I once was so mad at the police. So I thank the young man who just spoke because I was so mad and angry because I used to think that all of them were the same until I grew up. It took a long time for me to grow up though. It just happened, you know, uh, just a few years ago in fact, <laughs> that I learned this art called forgiveness. And in my forgiveness, I also learned that police are human beings. They're simply human beings. And many of them are fearful because they have that uniform on. They don't know what to expect from you. Sometimes you don't know what they've experienced. They may have had an argument with their wives or, you know, a friend or whatever. Whatever the situation is. But I have learned the art of forgiveness. And I thank you all for welcoming us tonight, girl. solve problems on, on many different subjects we have to get beyond the point where we say oh well, that can't be true so I'm not going to look at it I, I, I made some copies of some articles that were on the internet this week uh, anybody that wants one can have it here's uh, 1400 Jewish clergy deliver a letter to Congress demanding right to asylum for refugees and demanding that the concentration camps that Trump is running at the border be disbanded. That's what they are, they're concentration camps. They're not holding centers or processing centers or anything else. The goal is to terrorize children and their parents so they never want to come here. And so they don't care how many kids die from malnutrition or anything else down there. The breast is not covering uh, because reporters aren't being allowed in there mostly. Second thing, there's a, we published an article, nobody seems to be talking about the elephant in the room, which is the Supreme Court passed the Citizens United ruling 2010, or I think it was 2010, mm -hmm. but that allows billionaires to own and operate their stable of intellectual prostitutes. They're not selling sex, they're selling their votes and these intellectual prostitutes in the Senate and Congress are being paid to pack our courts with judges like Brett Kavanaugh, Clarence Thomas, uh, Robert Bork, 
the people, that, the only place these judges are being taken from is the Federalist Society. And the Federalist Society was designed to groom young right-wing politicians to masquerade as lawyers and judges so they can be appointed to these courts to rule. Think rulings that will give us Flint, Michigan type pollution everywhere in the country. They're, they're right now they're trying to repeal all regulations on every kind of environmental you think going back 50 years. Another one, here's an article that says we must wake the world from slumber to tackle the existential crisis of our days and that is the rapidly growing knowledge that climate change is happening now. It's not in the future. The climate crisis is now. And weekly, more people, more students are joining the Fridays for the Future movement. It's global. It's big. There's a huge walkout coming September 20th. So, anybody wants any one of these copies, I'll pass them out as I leave. I'm working on a, a, a presentation of what we're going to we're going to summarize the database. There's three, there's three numbers that can be understood by anybody beyond the age of seventh grade. Number three, number seven, and number twelve. Number twelve is the one we just. Could you quit banging the plates around for a little bit while we're trying to talk here? I'd appreciate it. It breaks our concentration up here does mine anyway, but maybe that's because I'm old. Number 12 is how many years we have left before the window of opportunity closes in 2030, probably a lot sooner to do anything about the catastrophic climate change that's coming in 2050 and 2060. The world's not going to end in 2030. I'll put up $100, you put up 5 and we'll debate your bullshit, Charlie. How's that sound? Let's have a debate. I'll give you the Let's not get hours. into it now, please. Because we oh, get, we get these personal million. attacks, and I'm, I'm, I'm fed up with them. Oh, man. The second, the second number. What you say. Give me a, okay, another 20 seconds. The second number is number three. Three buildings were destroyed. Three, three towers were destroyed with pre placed explosives on 9 11 when only two plane crashes. A child can do the math and go from there. Also, the number seven, all seven buildings that have trade center numbers on them, that are part of the World Trade Center, all seven buildings, three towers and four other buildings, they were damaged or destroyed with pre-placed explosives that day. The Muslims have nothing to do with it, and anybody that keeps criticizing us for saying we're all the wars, uh, everything, Trump and his people, it's all being enabled by the idea that we were attacked by Muslims on 9-11. We puncture that myth, bring the troops home from everywhere, start working in this country mm -hmm. with, without oil. There's a nationwide movement now to get off oil. Mm -hmm. Shut the gas off to your furnace and go solar. It's cheaper than oil. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so All right, that's what we got here. Oh, we got a little time here. All right, let's thank Ellen for her presentation here. Thank you to our guest here. Thank you, sir. I wish you the best. Very much. I'm going to be eclectic here as usual. Uh, last week, uh, we learned that there were no airplanes used in bringing down the Twin Towers in New York City. I went home, and during the week, there was a documentary about Osama bin Laden. And it said Osama bin Laden actually originally planned to use 10 airplanes. Uh, in planning his attack on the United States, but somehow from 10 planes he got to zero planes, uh, according to the, the theorists here in the United States. The other thing is, uh, you keep harping on this building, I guess it's number seven, uh, the, I think you call it a debris field. Yeah. You have a hundred, a massive building, hundred stories tall, and it's having some issues here. It's on fire and flames, uh, and surprisingly, you can't deal with the fact that the building across the street caught on fire. Well, the debris field of that is probably three blocks at minimum. Uh, so I don't know. Where are you coming from? Uh, let's get back to some few other things here. 
uh, regarding free speech. Uh, I, I just wanted to, that was the original topic, uh, it's a topic which I've dealt with over the years. Uh, no speech is exercised in the absolute. Uh, those who think you have constitutional guarantees uh, regarding free speech, that constitution applies only to the government of the United States. It does not apply to the rest of the United States. That's why when you go into work, your supervisor can tell you to sit down and shut up and get to work. And among the rules he's got is that you can't criticize him because that constitution does not guarantee you any rights in that work, in that environment. So keep that in mind. Uh, speech which is of no value is not protected. Uh, so even the theorists have run into this, that some have said that their speech is of no value. <laughs> I won't go into that one though. Uh, censorship is something that is done only by a government agency. There's no such thing as censorship by other parts of the country, such as television, the media, and so forth. They can do whatever they want. They own their own stations. Uh, the internet then owns their own. Uh, and there are no regulations that pertain to over them. So uh, that. Now the other thing regarding the police department, you've got to be cautious about using this approach of anecdotal information because for every example, there is a counterexample. And guess what happens? If you give an example, there's a counterexample. You go on an example, you go on forever and you never achieve the truth. So that approach just doesn't mean anything whatsoever, you know. And we heard it a little bit here, but uh, anyhow, that's all right. I guess we're going to hear from you conspiracy guys here again, you know. I guess. <laughs> You guys are still working on it, but um, that's what I say. I'd like to know how we came from 10 planes to zero, though, Ted. Too easy. Yeah. There were never any planes. He said, Osama said he was going to use 10 of them. He cut back. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. Good job. See any young man who take care of this. You get the final word. <laughs> final word. You want to take planes? Yeah. What do you mean? So, uh, Lisa, yes, I did. When you look at corruption, it ain't just the police. Corruption went from the beat cop to the top of City Hall. Look at our aldermen. The building inspectors have always been known being on the take. This is just a stinking corrupt city. Uh, and they're all Democrats. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Republicans are curious to So we get the last word. Uh, um, if any, we want to come in and rebut their rebuttals. Um, I, one thing I want to say is, uh, um, you know, it's, it comes down to character, and I want to say, Ted, um, Ted over there, uh, truth seekers, um, you know, I honor you and thank you uh, for holding on to the truth, and Andy, and uh, this conspiracy theory, um, you know, we're, it's, it was invented by the CIA and uh, placed by People like Charlie work for the FBI and whose job is to uh, rain on the truth with lies. So there, there's, you know, they pay people to misinform us. That's, that's the deal. And to keep us silent and to maintain the code of silence. And um, we, you know, we just have to, the truth will set us free. It will prevail, um, you know, and... That's what gives you, you know, the courage. I, thank you, Jonathan, also a great truth teller, philosopher, um, you know, who 
he's talked about Thoreau, the majority of one, uh, you know, um, really is a, a philosopher and a poet, and uh, you know, that's where, we, we talked about the making of meaning at Bob's house last night, that uh, it is subjectively science is in your, you know, the mind of the scientist who is seeking truth. And uh, I tell you, a country that, a world that doesn't have truth to stand on is a very dangerous, uh, you know, totalitarian um, place to live. And I, I did find a great book on um, fascism, uh, the F word or something. And, you know, this authoritarianism, uh, we have to start talking about it. Say what they don't want us to say. The rest is PR. But it, it, it is authoritarianism, and it, and with something else, um, also John Dean wrote Authoritarians Without Conscience. Um, you know, we, we got to, back in the old days, the public education was, was developed, and college education, to, um, I'm trained to be a teacher to, you know, we're, we, you've got to like think honestly and truthfully. And a, a teachers had to, we realized that democracy is at risk if we, uh, you've got a bunch of immoral bullies messing with each other. Um, you know, we have to have citizens. And, and that's why, Charlie, they have the fairness doctrine that was put in in 1948 that said the public airways belong to the people yeah, um, yeah. and that's why they, uh, yeah. they it's given to free to the broadcasters and they they put that law in because there's a Ku Klux Klan guy abusing his power over the airways to organize a Ku Klux Klan rally and it's real simple they you know they said you, if you're not in the public interest you you know step aside mr ceo you know um that's not we have to have the public interest truth in our media we you know we they got it for free basically then what happened in 1980s these same federalist society crooks if you want them to say something well, you're going to have to wrap up all right yeah the same society crooks came in and um threw out the fairness doctrine they said we have cable so no problem we have plenty of competition, you know, truth will, you know, bubble up yeah. somehow. It's a big lie. And More that uh, put in by these these lawyers. Uh, and so that's my final word. All right. I got a final saying. Go ahead and wrap it up for Let us. Let me confirm for you guys. I am an American. I believe in the United States. I fought for the United States. I defended it. My people helped build it. This is our country. Not the Trumps. He didn't do nothing for the country. And you look like you're trying to sell out to the Russians. I'm in America. I believe in this. I just All want right. To yeah. Well, we'll close us out. Nah. And a veteran. And, uh, close us out. Yeah. Gratitude. You need to run for office. We're adjourned. Okay. Thank you for coming. Yes, sir. Yeah, the gavel. Yeah, nice meeting you guys, too. Good life. 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 Good life.